Welcome to Mr. Raleigh's Virtual Music Classroom. I'm Mr. Raleigh, and this video is the first in a series that I will be teaching basic music theory geared towards the middle and high school age music students. In most school music programs, students don't get many opportunities to really gain a deep understanding of music theory or music history or the things that we're unable to teach with a high level performance schedule. This series of videos will help students gain a deeper understanding. These videos could also be for a beginner in music of any age who wants to learn how music is created and why music works the way it does. So I hope you enjoy and let's start learning a little bit about music theory. I want to take this opportunity to tell mostly music educators, but even those of you learning on your own right now, that these lessons, especially these first few lessons in music theory, are a little bit dry. I'm still working on my uh, production value. I'm getting better at it. Uh, but I don't have a lot of supplemental material to put in these, so they're very lecture-based. That can be a little bit boring. Uh, but to gain, get into the nuts and bolts of music theory and, and, and understanding how notes work together, chords and all that, we need to have an understanding of some of these basics first. Um, these lessons through music theory will also lend themselves as helps for other lessons I'm going to be giving on songwriting and composing as well. So again, they're a little dry. I apologize about that as my production values get better. Maybe these early lessons will be remade. Um, so they're a little bit higher quality um, and less boring. Um, I don't mean them to be boring, but the information is very important uh, in order to really understand. So I hope we can uh, go, you go on this journey with me and you have an understanding. Um, I just wish it was a little more um, high production value, but we'll get there. The definition of music theory is simply the study of the practices and possibilities of music. The Oxford Companion to Music and the Oxford New Grove Dictionary of Music, two of the most scholarly uh, publications that define terms and all the parts and pieces of music, uh, state that, or they describe music theory as three interrelated topics. One, the rudiments of music, the understanding of the symbols, the sounds of music, and how they work together to make music what it is for the listener and the performer. Two, learning scholarly views regarding music from antiquity, the olden days, to the present. And three, a subtopic of musicology, musicology is the study of the history of music basically, that seeks to define processes and general principles in music. However, to dive into all of that, we need a simple defini definition of what music is. So let's look at that. When you look up the word music in a simple dictionary, you will get something like this. Music, now, one, an art of sound and time that expresses ideas and emotions is significant forms through the elements of rhythm, melody, harmony, and color. Two, the tones or sounds employed occurring in single line melody or multiple lines harmony and sounded or to be sounded by one or more voices or instruments or both. Three, musical work or compositions for singing or playing. Four, the written or printed score of a musical composition. Five, such score collectively. Six, any sweet, pleasing, or harmonious sounds or sound, such as the music of the waves or wind blowing through the trees. Seven, appreciation of or responsiveness to musical sounds or her, her harmonies, such as music was in his soul. Eight, fox hunting, the cry of the hounds. Nine, face the music, to meet, take, or accept the consequences of one's mistake or actions, etc., such as he squandered his money and now he's got to face the music. That is a lot. There is nothing necessarily wrong with that definition. There's just a lot to unpack and understand. I have coined a more simple definition that is much easier to understand and unpack. My definition is music is an organized combination of sounds and silence. 
the four words that are important here are organized, combination, sounds, and silence. We can talk about those four parts of the definition through discussing and learning about the elements of music. Each of the elements work in coordination with one another to allow composers, conductors, performers to create the music that we listen to and enjoy. Philosophers and scholars have said that music is the most human of the arts. I don't disagree, but that is a whole different discussion and debate. I do agree that music touches humans in very deep and emotional ways that many times cannot be explained. We use music to reinforce a myriad of human emotions, from mourning to celebration, from profound love to debilitating hate. And I would argue that the reason that music moves us so, as humans, is that all of the elements that are the building blocks of creating music are the concepts, ideas, and structures that we inherently understand through our subconscious as humans. The way our mind, our brain, and our body work together to enjoy life and to live and maybe even not enjoy things. It encompasses it all. The elements of music are form, pitch, rhythm, melody, harmony, timbre, dynamics, tempo, texture, and notation or the symbols of music. Having a basic definition and understanding of all of these elements will strengthen our understanding of what music is and then allow us to study the hows and the whys of music theory. So let's begin our journey. These discussions about the elements of music are very short and basic understandings and definitions. Uh, we can go into, we could go into f far more depth on each of them, but for the purposes of this video, I want to give just a simple uh, under, uh, definition and explanation so we have a, a pretty good understanding of, of the different elements. So let's start with form. We like and enjoy music or not because our subconscious understands it, mostly on an emotional level. One of the reasons for that is because music has form. Form is the element of music that keeps music from just being noise. When music is created, there is almost always some kind of pattern. Those patterns are based on thematic material of some kind. Some of the other elements, such as melody, harmony, and rhythm, help us define and determine what the thematic material is. Over thousands of years of music history with different cultures of musical creation, there have existed a plethora of different forms. Those that listen to music and those that create music have settled on some forms that are more widely used. And those are the forms that I'll be discussing here. Susan K. Langer in her book, Feeling and Form, stated that music is time made audible. She goes on to say, proper perception of a musical work depends on the ability to associate what is happening in the present, what has happened in the past, and what one expects to happen in the future. The frustrations or the fulfillment of such expectations and the resulting tensions and releases are basic to most musical works. This concept requires structure and form provides that structure. Over time, music scholars have given labels and some names to these forms. The labels tend to be simply to assign a letter to each part of the form to show pattern. The most simple label is binary form, labeled A, B. The A section is different thematic material than the B section. Our most simple folk songs and popular songs follow this form, like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, alternating, the verse being the A section and the chorus being the B section. However, binary form isn't our most simple identifying form. Call and response is even less complex, though incredible music nonetheless. Call and response is simply one person or a small group singing a theme and a larger group repeating that same thing, but collectively, with little and usually no change. Really good examples of this are, if you've ever seen or heard a group of Native American performers at a powwow, a group may be sitting around a large powwow drum, uh, pounding out a fairly co less complex. I don't like the word simple because simple means it may be less, 
uh, academic. That's not the case at all. Music is music. But they usually put, put a very steady beat where all of them are playing on the drum. One person chants a, a part of a song. We refer to it as a chant in Native American music. And then the rest of the drummers around the drums sing the same thing. Sometimes they may, might add a little inflection, um, but in this sense, they're singing the exact same words and the exact same melody that came out of the first singer. Another example of call and response were the uh, African slave songs, slave work songs, um, especially working in the fields. Um, and there's a whole nother history that I'll talk about later on how that would later grow into gospel music and spirituals and then, and then jazz. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about this simple form. The African slave work songs, uh, they'd be in the fields working and one person would sing a line and then the rest of the workers around them would sing the line again and that would continue on and there's a way that they dealt with the uh, redundancy of the work they had to do. So that gives you an idea of a fairly simple form that's even more simple, simple than the AB binary form. And again, remember, simple does not mean less than. It just means it's a form that's easier to identify. The AB form, still used in songwriting today, evolved throughout music history and led to most of the other forms we'll be discussing in this lesson. Early songs used AB or AAB form that would also be used in early dance music and then evolving into A-A-B-B-A-A or A-A-B-B-A-B-A-B. At some point during the development, the form began garnering other names. As larger works of music began to be prominent, the term song form or later sonata allegro form or sometimes first movement form was used to describe the form of these pieces of music. As music continued to change and evolve, especially throughout the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, we end up getting even more forms. And again, we can look at these labels that they were using. They added a small piece of something completely different thematically to a song, which would be in just regular songs. We sometimes refer to that as the bridge today, but they just called it a C section. So an A, B, C, a, B, A, or something like that. You'd have that C in the middle, which is just a little bit of change. We hear that still today in forms of popular music. You also had, in the uh, 1700s especially, a um, very prominent form that came into being called the Rondo form, where there was a main theme, A, and then subsequent different themes throughout the piece, always coming back to A. We refer to this form as A, B, A, C, A, D, A, etc. Another very common form was the theme and variations, which is basically an A, 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 A very, uh, form. Well, that doesn't make any sense, but it actually is better to put it this way. A, A1, A2, A3, where you have a main theme, and then that theme is played in different ways throughout the piece theme and variations. There's other forms of music called through composed ABC. These are the more simple forms that you hear in music. And there are even other forms like canon and the fugue, 12 bar blues and other blues forms, rhythm changes, aleatoric music or chance music. We can go and have a whole set of lessons just on forms to really describe them in a deeper context, but that's not really important for this lesson. But just understand that all music, or most all music, has some type of form that it follows to be understanding to the listener. Repetition is good. Repetition of different themes and different parts and pieces of a piece of music creates its form. Pitch is simply the range of sound, the highness or lowness of the sounds we hear in music. However, we can hear pitch all around in everything we encounter with our sense of hearing. Even people who are deaf can sense through feel differences in pitch. 
It's a great scene in a great movie called Mr. Holland's Opus, uh, where the character of Mr. Holland's son is deaf, and he brings lights into a concert, um, and where he can, he and his deaf uh, other deaf friends could experience the music that way. But there's another scene in the movie where he's sitting on top of a speaker. Um, in his home listening to music very very loudly and he could feel it through his body from the vibrations so it does it isn't just about our ears it can also be about the feeling that pitch can have um, pitch also again like I say isn't just in music it's in everything we hear I have a brother-in-law who is a um, mechanic and he can tell if there's a sound in your car uh, good or bad that could tell him something through the pitch of that sound. Pitch is just, again, the highness and lowness of sound. Rhythm is how music moves through time. It refers to the length or duration of sounds and how those durations of sound interact with the other elements of music, such as pitch and tempo and notation, to give music a feeling of motion. Melody is the tune of a song, that part you hum or whistle when you know a song really, really well. I sometimes call it the main theme of a piece, although most music will have more than one theme or even main theme. It is a way to understand what melody is. It's the tune, the part you can identify. I will usually teach my littlest students the way to understand melody is we tend to think of songs by their words, but if I do this, la 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 I don't have to tell you the words to that song for you to know that it's the birthday song. Happy birthday to you. Another one I use with little ones that is very understandable to them La 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 so on and so forth. Again, they always within the few first few notes they identify that as jingle bells. Probably the only Christmas song we most of them know when they're five and six years old. But they can identify those because of the song's melody. Harmony is a little more complex than melody, or better put, more difficult to understand. Harmony is the sounds that accompany the melody. Now this can take place many ways. You may be singing a melody and another person singing with you is singing the same words, maybe even in the same rhythm, but they're singing different pitches. And some of those pitches sound in consonant with the melody, which means they sound good together, or they may sound in dissonance with the notes of the melody, which means they sound bad together. It creates tension and release. That's probably the most prominent way we understand harmony to be. When we hear two or more singers singing different parts, it makes the song sound fuller, uh, more rich. But harmony can also mean accompanying instruments. For instance, when you hear a folk artist singing and playing their guitar, the parts they're playing on the guitar are, in a sense, harmony. If a whole rock band is playing with uh, one singer out front, all the parts and pieces that they're playing, and sometimes if they're singing background vocals, that all becomes part of the harmony. So harmony can be complex um, understanding, but just think of it as this. It is those parts and pieces in a piece of music that accompany the melody. Timbre refers to the quality of a sound or a group of sounds. The easiest way to understand timbre and quality of sound is this. We can tell the difference between people's voices. I use this activity sometimes with, again, young, my youngest students, is I'll have them sit around in a circle, uh, close their eyes, and as I come by, I'll walk around the circle, as I come by, um, I, have, I tap on one of their shoulders and I tell them to say hello or something simple. And then I ask all the other students with their eyes closed if they can tell who it is. And they can because they know the timbre of that student's voice because they've been together long enough to understand that. We know that a flute sounds different than a trumpet or a snare drum sounds different than a tom-tom. 
We know this because of the timbre of their sound, the quality of their sounds. Composers use different timbres to create the soundscapes that they want when creating a piece of music. That is what timbre is and or quality of the sound. Dynamics in music is concerned with the volume, the loudness and softness of sound. When a composer wants a passage to be very soft, it just can create a certain mood. There's notation and symbols, which we'll talk about later, that tell the musicians to play at a certain volume level. There's also, the same thing can go the other way. If the composer wants a very, very big sound, that's about dynamics. There's also notation that te teaches us to gradually get louder or gradually get softer. All of those things are part of what we call dynamics in music. Tempo is another fairly easy element to understand. Tempo is about speed, how fast or slow music goes. Again, composers use different tempos to create different moods or emotions that they want to have in their music. Something that's very, very slow would have a very different meaning musically than something that's very, very fast. Tempo, again, is just the speed or how fast or slow music travels through time. Texture is actually a really hard concept to understand when speaking about the elements of music. We tend to think of texture as something that you feel with your hands. You know, we feel my sweater is soft because of the material it's made out of. Sandpaper can be rough or smooth depending on the grit it has. Um, that's usually what we think of it in texture. In music it's a little bit different because we don't touch music with our hands, but we hear it. And texture deals with the thickness or thinness of what we are taking in. And again, that's a little abstract, so let's think about that. If I'm just a solo piano player, just me, sitting down at the piano playing a piece of music, much like the composer Chopin did. That would be considered somewhat a thin texture because it's one musician. Now he's using 10 fingers and playing lots and lots of keys, so he could be playing a thick texture of music. If he's playing just one note at a time, that would be a thin texture. If he's playing all 10 fingers at once, that would be a thick texture. A solo singer compared to a large choir, thin to thick. Simple chords compared to very complex chords with lots and lots of different sounds going on and different functions of those sounds, thin to thick textures. So that's kind of what texture is about. It's the, not necessarily the quality of sound like timbre, it's the thinness or thickness of sound. How many sounds are we getting at once as a listener? That is how we would describe texture. And finally, notation or the symbols of music. This is another lesson. In fact, it's the next lesson. Um, and there's so many symbols of music. It is its own language. And so therefore musicians who learn how to read music and dissect and understand and be, are able to describe and define all of those symbols in music have learned another language. Um, and so the symbols of music is its own lesson, but they are basically the things that are written on the page that tell musicians what to do um, and what the composer intends them to do. Remember, that's symbols and that's on the next level. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson about the elements of music. The things that we've talked about in this lesson will help you understand many, many more of the concepts that are to come. Uh, having a grasp of the terminology will really help. And not only for the, the music theory lessons I'm offering, but also for the music composition and songwriting lessons that I'll also be part of my uh, classroom here. So I hope you enjoyed them, and here's to more learning in the future. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying my lessons. Uh, this is the first music theory lesson, but there's lots of other lessons to choose from. Please uh, like, share, and subscribe.